Hi, and welcome to episode five of our unit on opinions and organizations. I'm Mr. Wahlberg. Uh, our short agenda, let's see, the sub should have taken attendance. Uh, open yourself in prayer. Uh, we're in episode five of interest groups. Our next class is chapter 12 of the media. That's our final chapter, so make sure you do it well. And our test, pay attention when the test is on the calendar. It's probably just a couple of days away. All right, we have five objectives. You should be able to explain what an interest group is and evaluate its role in U.S. politics. You should be able to detail the types of interest groups based on their membership. You should be able to describe the role of membership in interest groups. That sounds kind of similar to each other. We should be able to explain the various ways in which interest groups try to influence the policymaking process and describe the ways in which interest groups' political activity has been limited. We'll begin in Roman numeral number 18. An interest group is an organization of people that share a common interest or goal and try to seek influence public policy. That's their goal. Uh, it's not only that they have a common interest, it's that they want to go and shape policy for it. An interest group doesn't run its own candidates for office. There's no, um, I don't know, NRA candidate. They, can't, they might sponsor can or they might... Um, uh, you know, sponsor candidates or endorse them, but they don't. Re there's no like NRA party. Those are political parties that are not interest groups. Not the same thing. An interest group is also called a lobby, and that term comes to us from the 1800s when interest group members would wait in, wait in the halls outside of legislative chambers. They were in the lobbies, so they're called lobbyists, and they try to influence um, legislation that way. Uh, are interest groups good or bad? Well, there's various opinions on this. First, we'll turn to uh, an early political scientist, uh, a Frenchman who studied the American system kind of in the chaos of the years after um, the French Revolution, Alice de Tocqueville. And uh, Tocqueville was a French political thinker and historian. He's best known for his works uh, called Democracy in America. And he analyzed it, the improved living standards and social conditions of people, as well as their relationship to the market and the state in Western societies. Tocqueville was a Frenchman. Uh, you know, he lived in the time of the French Revolution, the restoration of the monarchy, the republic again, and he studied the American system to see why it worked. He was amazed at the variety of interest groups in the United States. They ranged, and he said they... They are Americans of all ages, all conditions, all dispositions, constantly forming associations. And he said that it was possible because of our strong democratic culture. And he thought that forming the associations was one of the things that made America great. It was one of the things that made America, America, that people could associate together and bond, uh, bond groups. Um, and those, those you know, associations then could shape the greater culture at large. On the other hand, we have James Madison. And Madison... Uh, was pretty worried about interest groups. He called them factions in Federalist 10, and he warned about the dangers of interest groups, and he said that those are, these are going to be the major divisions in American society. We also interpret factions to mean like political parties, but here I think it's fair to use both, uh, both understandings of the word. Madison said it was inevitable that substantial differences would develop between factions, that it was only natural for, say, farmers to oppose merchants and tenants to oppose landlords. Also, that each faction would try to beat the other, and that in you know it was in the base the best basic interest to try to persuade the government to adopt policies that it favored over the expense of their rivals. He noted that the cause of factions, his line was, are sown into the nature of man. But Madison also warned that removing factions could mean removing freedom, and so the way to control fractions was factions was to limit their effects by structuring the government so that a majority faction couldn't actually suppress the rights of any others. Um, Madison didn't. Like, didn't think there was a reasonable way to end factions or end interest groups. They just thought that um, the way you control their power is by empowering all interest groups and all factions, give everyone a, uh, you know, a shot to influence policy, and then they will counteract each other. The ambition will counteract ambition. At Robin Uber number 12, we'll talk about the types of interest group based on their uh, their membership, like who, who joins these groups and, and how do you categorize them all together. The first thing we'll talk about is um, institutional interests. Institutional interests are made of individuals, organizations who represent other organizations. They, you know, usually businesses or governments or foundations or universities. That's a institutional interest. They don't represent like individual citizens. They represent other organizations. This kind of lobby represents very important issues for their clients, like controlling international competition for some, in, you know, particular industry. Uh, yeah. The next group that we'll talk about is the membership interests, and here we're talking about individuals, not members of other organizations. So in, individuals are membership interest groups. 
Membership interest groups are supported by the activities and contributions of individual citizens. They are organizations that represent individuals for social, business, labor, or charitable purposes. They want to get their you know, certain civil or political goals. The famous examples might include the NAACP or the Sierra Club or the NRA or a group called Common Cause, something like that. They would all be classic examples of membership interest groups. These... Um, these appeal to people on an ideological level and then on a public interest level. Uh, ideological interest groups, in particular, appeal to people with an interest in a coherent set of political convictions or of controversial principles. These might be the Christian Coalition or the National Organization for Women. That um, they're, They have an ideology that they want to push in particular. A public interest lobby is a political organization whose goal will benefit basically non-members, people who are not members of the, um, the so then you know, in one side you're, you know, putting forward an ideological cause and the public interest, they're trying to advocate for people that aren't even members of their group, uh, public interest lobby, and their goal will benefit non-members. They may be controversial, but tend to be highly partisan uh, or divisive organizations like um, NARAL or Operation Rescue. Uh, the, these, you know, they don't have to be controversial, but they often are. There's another type of organization. I don't have a slide on this one, um, but it's called a letterhead organization, and those really aren't organizations. They're just uh, maybe one or two people that make an official sounding name and get a logo and write a letter. Um, letterhead organizations, they may or may not be influential in politics. Um, I think today in the internet age, those don't usually last very long. In Roman number 20, let's talk about membership, or basically how do groups get strong? Uh, what's the role of membership uh, in an organization? So what does make a group strong? The best resource for any group is large, politically active membership. It uh, brings voting muscle. It brings financial resources. It brings the ability to grow the cause. Maintaining membership is easier for certain kinds of uh, membership groups than others. It's particularly good for businesses, professional groups, labor associations. Um, you know, if it's directly related to your job, people are more likely to go uh, work on its behalf than, you know, uh, citizen groups that it's not directly related to their work. So uh, the National Education Association, the American Medical Association, the ABA, the American Bar Association, or the NSPE, something like that, those, these are all lobbying groups. They're, um, they are interest groups, and uh, they generally recruit and sustain membership pretty easily. There is one of the problems that you find uh, with interest groups, and that is the the free rider problem. The free rider problem is that you know if the uh, National Organization of Women is arguing for women's rights, you don't. If you're a woman, you don't actually have to be a member of the NOW to benefit from their work, and that's that's called uh, being a free rider. Um, encouraging membership is difficult in especially associations that aren't related to your work. Um, adding one more individual member to an organization doesn't actually you know, really affect the effectiveness of the organization. Uh, and because people have uh, the tendency to avoid contributing to public goods, the thing of which all individuals share, whether or not they contribute to it, that's how you get the free rider problem. This is the you know, the fourth member of your small group who's not doing anything. They're just sitting there and they're going to, you know, relax on your grade. That's a free rider problem. To solve the free rider problem and to grow membership, groups often uh, offer incentives for joining. Those incentives are something of value that they can't get without joining. Um, there's a couple of different kinds. The first one we'll talk about is a solidarity incentive. A solidarity incentive is the reward, the social rewards that lead people to join a political organization. Um, you know, the, the League of Women Voters or the Parent Teacher Association, something like that. Uh, they give people a sense of pleasure or status or companionship, and that's a solidarity incentive, like you have solidarity with other members of the group. Um, material incentives are the money or things valued in monetary terms that include membership. These might be low-cost life insurance or equipment or business supplies. The, you know, the AARP, you get discounts at, um, you know, car rental places, something like that, if you're an old person who rents a car. Um, those are material benefits. And there's also purpose of uh, incentives, that purpose-filled incentives that benefit from you know, serving a cause or a principle. It's the most difficult for groups to provide, but they 
they provide benefits to people who aren't even members of the group, which is why the group exists, like lobbies to stop hunger or animal abuse. Uh, people join PETA because they love animals and they want to support them and they find purpose in their membership. Certain membership patterns exist that some sectors of society are better represented than others. Certain people are more likely to belong to an interest group. If a person works in a business or a profession, they are more likely to join an interest group. So when I was waiting tables, um, if there even is a restaurant server lobby, I don't know what it is, but um, you know, in, there's several teachers uh, lobbyist groups. I'm not a member of any of them, but you, you might be. Uh, people that have a high level of education, the longer that you stay in school, the more likely you are to join some kind of an interest group. Uh, people with high incomes and really even middle income earners are more likely to join interest groups than poor people are. And why is that? Well, socioeconomic level correlates very strongly to the political participation of its members. Rich people are you know, more likely to have a high feeling of efficacy, that they're, what they do matters. <clears throat> poor people are more likely to feel like their effort is worthless and that nothing they do matters. So we find there's a strong correlation in membership patterns with socioeconomic level. Roman numeral number 21. So what are the activities of interest group? What, what do they do in influencing public policy? So we would say that they have five basic roles, representation, participation, education, agenda building, and program monitoring. Let's talk about them like this. Uh, representation, they represent people to the government. If you go and join Greenpeace, your voice to the government says that there are people that care about environmental issues, and they're going to represent those issues of their members to the government. Like a congressman represents a district, so lobbyists represent their group. Participation uh, provides a way for like-minded citizens to join up in political action and get more people involved in the process. Uh, it's particularly important to groups with solidarity incentives. So March for Life is a good example of a participatory interest group. It gives people a way to go demonstrate against their government on uh, pro-life issues. Education uh, is about the member. Okay, so the education works two ways. They educate their members about politics, what's going on in the, you know, in the greater political sphere. So they tell their, their members like, okay, so Congress is advancing on this bill, something like that. And the public, um, they also to educate the government about their subject. Um, cause you know, members of the government aren't usually experts on every set. They're never experts on every subject, but on any particular issue uh, and, and rely on interest groups to go inform them and educate them on whatever the subject is. Uh, the more political type of information that lobbies provide is what's called a political cue. They, um, give like signal telling to legislators uh, what values are at stake in a vote and how that issue fits into their own political views and a party agenda. Uh, these you know political cues tell the congressperson who is against a proposal and what are the costs of taking various positions. These are things that uh, people expect lobbyists or uh, special interests to go do. Um, sometimes they tell issue you know tell legislators what issue needs to be considered closely or maybe what is falling off the radar. <clears throat> Interest groups often release ratings on uh, people that ratings are like these assessments of a representative's voting record on issues that are important to the group. Agenda building is the process by which new issues are brought into political awareness. They make the government aware of problems and see if they can be solved. Maybe a classic example of agenda building is Black Lives Matter that uh, with persistent effort has really put the question of um, police treatment of minorities on the political agenda. And then program monitoring is a way that uh, they keep tr interest groups keep track of government programs. That's a usual function of interest groups. They draw attention to officials and hold them accountable for policies for enforcement. This could be like, you know, somebody has a 28% rating from the NRA or something like that. that that's program monitoring. Their main... Uh, Activity is um, is lobbying, and there's a couple of different kinds of lobbying. The first one we'll talk about is direct lobbying, which is an attempt to influence a legislator's vote through personal contact with the legislator. So they go and try to influence the uh, legislator directly on. Personal lobbying is the process of maintaining contact with uh, staffers, whether in Congress or with an agency, and they maintain contact with those staffers to constantly provide them with pertinent data. They might also participate in legal advocacy, which is the policy, which is the process of reaching policy goals by suing in the courts and asking the judge make a ruling to benefit the organization. So the ACLU operates like this, that uh, they're a lobby organization, but their main goal is to go sue people and do legal advocacy on questions of civil rights. Another type of lobbying that we'll discuss here is called grassroots lobbying. Uh, grassroots lobbying is when activities are performed 
by the members of an interest group, by the rank and file members, not by the professional lobbyists. Um, grassroots lobbying is very effective, although very difficult to coordinate um, by interest group members or would-be members in there. They contact government officials. If you have ever written a letter to your congressman, you've participated in grassroots lobbying. Um, those, because uh, you're just a member rather than a professional lobbyist. Lobbying has gone from an insider strategy, where the goal is to go know as many Congress people as possible, to an outsider strategy, where the goal is to put as many emails on the congressman's desk as possible. That, um, and that's probably a change of technology, which allows information to be gathered quickly, but also communication to happen easier. These tactics often include letter writing campaigns or protests of the members. They um, they're most effectively used in conjunction with direct lobbying. So again, if you've participated in a, a protest, you've done grassroots lobbying, um, and uh, it's most effective when there's also somebody on the inside working with direct lobbying. Protesting is usually designed to get media attention, but protests are often short-lived, and the policymaking is a long-term process. So people might go protest, but the protest could fizzle out. There was a few years ago that there was the Occupy Wall Street protests, for banking reform and economic reform, those protests got a lot of um, got a lot of attention, but they weren't sustainable. And policymaking is slow. And now nobody talks about Occupy Wall Street anymore. Lobbying groups might also take care of information campaigns. These are organized efforts to gain public backing by bringing a group's views to attention. Information campaigns assume that public interest and apathy are as much of the problem as competing interest groups, that uh, just raising awareness might be one of the key issues. They might use a public relations campaign, flyers and websites and advertisement and promotional activities and community meetings, something like that. They may also sponsor research and an information campaign to show the costs or benefits of proposed policy changes. Interest groups may also take care of building coalitions where several interest groups join together for lobbying. And they may be obvious connections, or they may not be obvious connections to build coalitions. Um, there, if there's multiple interest groups with overlapping interests or overlapping members, the groups may build uh, coalitions, and they may be just temporary coalitions to lobby jointly. So let's say that a person is interested in environmental care of the oceans, then they could be involved with Seas at Risk or Greenpeace or Surfers Against Sewage. And uh, all of these groups have probably different memberships to them, and they certainly have different tactics and goals, but they might find coalition building is effective for reaching their policy goals. In our last class, we talked about political action committees and how PACs work. Uh, PACs work as an interest group here that they can pull contributions from group members and donate to candidates running for political office. Now, surprisingly, and this does surprise people because it's counterintuitive, money is probably the least effective way that interest groups advance their causes. There is no consistent link between campaign donations and influence in congressional voting. This is very counterintuitive, and it's not what the popular wisdom says, but the reality is that there's, there's very little evidence that um, campaign money gets policy results. But what campaign money does is give access to legislators. Uh, if a person is a, is a big donor of a PAC and they call their congressman, their congressman will probably pick up the phone. It gets them access. It doesn't necessarily get the results, but it gets them access, uh, an opportunity to more, do more direct lobbying later. A lot of political action communities donate to both political parties at the same time. The goal is usually practical. It's to get access to the official, not necessarily to promote an ideology, although that could be secondarily or, or later down the chain. The biggest exception is that of labor unions. Labor unions give a lot of money and they give them pretty much exclusively to Democratic candidates. They, uh, labor unions pretty much give all of their money to Democrats and Democrats are very responsive to labor union issues. Uh, Republicans don't usually have a way to go compete for labor union money. Today, there are so many political action committees that there's lobbying money available on every side of every issue. And maybe that's exactly what James Madison hoped for in Federalist 10. Our final topic today is we're going to talk about the way in which interest groups' political activity is limited, or what is the line between money and free speech. We got into this just a little bit in our last class with the Citizens United decision as to whether or not money is speech. And I think the founders would say yes, that uh, the ability to influence policy is exactly what the First Amendment was about. And if free speech is standing on the corner to shout your uh, point of view, or it's to go hire an interest group to go speak on your behalf, or to donate money to causes they believe in, I think um, 
I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled yes, and I think in common sense we would say yes. Those are all perfect examples of freedom of speech. Now, an interest group is is their activity is also political speech protected by the First Amendment. So they, even beyond money, just the ability to go talk to a congressman, uh, to go spend time in the lobby, direct action, those are all actual examples of freedom of speech and the First Amendment rights. That said, lobbying laws are now tighter than they've ever been because there's always a question of whether or not special interest money is being used correctly or if it has too much influence or if uh, rich people are more likely to belong to a special interest group. Do they give an unfair access to the people who um, are already rich and powerful and systematically shut out people that are less rich and powerful? Well, lobbying laws are now tighter than ever. The most significant legal constraints on lobbying groups are in tax codes and campaign finance laws. They have to report where their money comes from, uh, who the lobbyists are, the issues on which they work. All of these, the goal is to make the uh, the money more transparent, to see, um, you know, like how money is being spent. Um, the, uh, the the thinking is is that the sunshine kills the germs, right? That uh, the, the reporting and saying where the money comes from means that it can't be dirty money or dark money. But it has also come with some unexpected risks. The Sunshine Laws have uh, have some unexpected risks to them. Um, they've been ineffective at bringing voter confidence. Uh, just because you know who owns your congressman, and I, I say that with tongue in cheek, but um, just because you know who owns your congressman doesn't mean that you can actually change the ownership or the, you know, the uh, bringing voter confidence to the process. I mean, the legislative branch is the least popular branch, and it kind of usually is, and it has a reputation of being tied to special interest. There's also another problem with sunshine laws, and that's in the, the era of really open access of data. Um, and uh, we have interest group bullying situations, and I think the best example of this is a now defunct website called 8Maps that said um, Proposition 8 was an advancement in California to put an amendment on their constitution ab about gay marriage, to uh, that marriage between a man and a woman, uh, and one of each. And so that, that was a, an effort for the, the eight maps. And so these were some lobbyists, and we don't know who, was able to put a Google Maps pin on the house of every single person that donated to... Um, the uh, traditional marriage lobby. And this seems like voter intimidation. This seems like uh, an unfair use of a public resource that the sunshine laws now uh, could work against people to, um, to vote on. This was a very sobering example in a lot of people, a lot of political watchers mind that um, you, you donate to a political interest and it's your free speech right to do so, but it also comes the risk of social bullying or maybe actual threats. I mean, why else would there be a pen on a person's house that you could drive up to their place? Um, so I, things like eight maps, I think, uh, tend to cool people's willingness to go um, and participate in a lot more of the interest groups. So that's kind of a sad way to end today's topic. It's kind of a heavy one, but you can save and close your notes. Jesus saves. And so should you.